I would like to um, suggest that we talk tonight about um, the good life and ask ourselves, is the good life what we really want, what we really aim for? I would like to suggest that consideration of ethical matters might be a very real improvement over our, our present concept of what constitutes the good life. And the, to begin with, <clears throat> we have some, this, some expanding problems it's rather incredible that it's the first time in geologic history it's ever happened that's been a simultaneous decline, decay and, and the quality of the land, and the quality of the atmosphere, and the quality of our res underground resources, the quality of our oceans, and the quality of our biological system that supports us. So we have a complexity of the, uh, this, I'm sure, is not really news to any of you that we're, we're pro projecting into a, into a future that is, go is looking pretty much like um, so something we need a Red Cross to help us, help us out of it. Um, David Orr, one of my favorite people at Oberlin College, has suggested that it looks to him as though we're in a, a crash course, where we're headed for major crisis, a, a collision between the needs of an expanding population of our own species and, and, and a decay of the quality of the, of the environment, the planetary environment that supports us. So the question that, that we could start with then to, tonight is, <clears throat> are we on a crash course? What are we using as a sort of a criteria for what we want to be in the longer term? And, and are there ways of, of improving our prospects and of trying to avoid the ma major kind of crash damage? Uh, Wendell Berry, another one of my most admired people, said um, that, that we have been, until September 11th, we have been um, we have been, had an unquestioning faith in our technological and economic structure that this would be sufficient to get us through hard problems, to leave it to the, the invent, inventiveness of our, our uh, engineers and our technologists, and they'll take care of things. But after September 11th, it, we, I think we were rudely awakened to, the, to realize that we're, the, the trajectory of our future is not going to be just exactly the way it has been over the last 50 years. I'd like to turn for a minute about guiding principles that we would consider how, I, how our society works. From the time of the, the biblical times, from uh, through the times of, um, of <clears throat> the Middle Ages and, uh, and say about to the 18th century, the way, the way our civilization um, was, so we say, was regulated was by a set of moral or religious directives. And these were almost always focused on negative rules. So for, for our purposes tonight, I'm discriminating between moral rules, which are saying thou shalt not, and ethical rules, which are the other end of the behavior extreme, which would be then what would really, what would guide you to a good, a good conclusion. So look at ethics as perhaps a guiding star that points a direction for us to proceed in, in contrast to a moral diction which says, don't do this. Now back to, the, to our, our, the good life. Um, I'm afraid that I, that in, in my opinion, it seems to me that we're, our dependence on technology and economics has led us to the point where we feel that everything is great if we have an SUV vehicle and if we have a laptop computer and <clears throat> the, the gimmicks that, that, that make things work more easily in our present situation. I think that from David Orr's commentary about the possibility of a big crash and Wendell Berry's concept that maybe we're, <laughs> we're not going to be as comfortable with these kinds of, of um, 
should we say, happiness makers as we have been in the past. This leads me then to the, I'd like to expand on the concept of ethics. I'm sure you're all very surprised because my father was, of course, the one who really um, established the concept of ethics and environmentalism. <clears throat> That's, of course, where I'm going. Another thing I wanted to say about our concepts of behavior in, this, in our civilization, our concepts of behavior are that we're in charge of the environment, that we're going to do this with this property, we're going to preserve the, 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 um, the wild country around the, the campus here at Binghamton University, or we're going to uh, send a man to the moon. And so it's, we're number one, and everything on the earth then is our management responsibility. We're the managers. And the, all of this point of view is very, I'm going to use the word anthropoc anthropocentric. It's focused on mankind as the, the kingpin, so to speak, that, <clears throat> that is in charge of what happens to all of the ecological things around us. And I'm going to spend some time this, this evening uh, working on a, an alternative direction. And the alternative to anthropocentrism would be to be biologically centered. This would we'll call this biocentric instead of anthropocentric. When I was a teenager, my father, Aldo Leopold, became quite concerned about the kind of a good life that I've just tried to sketch for you. The concept of the gimmicks, the tricks, the trades that, that, that constitute the good life and he did a very interesting and very novel, unheard, in a sense, unheard of kind of thing. He decided that he would take his family and he would buy a property out in a, in, in a farm somewhere where there was none of this. We didn't have, and he bought an 80 acre piece, which I'm gonna show you some photographs. He bought 80 acres out on the Wisconsin River floodplain. There was no electricity, of course, there was no water, there was any of the, the amenities that we take for, as a necessity for our households. And he put the family to work in a situation where the amenities that, sort of, that I've been talking about as being, I would, you might have guessed, I think of them as superficial, that the amenities were absent and the concept of doing something that would give you a, a rewarding lifestyle without the gimmicks. So I'm gonna take you to a, a, um, a brief tour of the shack. This was a piece of property that, that my father purchased for 80 acres, 80, 80, $8 an acre, he had 80 acres. The, the reason that it was so cheap was that the farmer had grown wheat and corn on it, wheat and corn, wheat and corn, until the, the, the nutrients were completely gone and the soil just wouldn't support anything but sand burrs and, um, and weeds. After the, this, this farmer, poor farmer, had exhausted the soil, he left. And he, he was displaced then by a bootlegger. And the bootlegger, uh, there was a house at the time at the, on the property. The bootlegger set up business in the house and he had the, the, the vats of whiskey down in the basement. But then unfortunately they caught fire. The whole house burnt down and the bootlegger was out in a minute. And that was the beginning of, should we say, the, the, the property that had none of the amenities whatsoever. So why don't we look at a picture? Here's a photograph of my father, Aldo Leopold, a professor of wildlife management at the University of Wisconsin. And here, of course, here he is working on some aspect of, of the quail. So here's dad in about 1930-35. That was just about the time that he purchased the shack. And the next slide will show you the first view that I had. I was a photography buff at the age of 15. And I climbed a hickory tree. And here you can see a part of the, um, the a limb that's of the tree that I'm on. Here we go. I'm on this hickory tree, and I took a, set, a series of shots to, make the, to get the whole thing. Now, there are a couple of things I want you to look at. 
The trees that are in the middle there are elm trees. These were on death's door. They were dying. And it took about three years for them to be completely dead. The, <coughs> the fields were, <coughs> were barren, except, as I say, for sand burrs, which were very troublesome on your socks. The, on the top left there, perhaps you can see a, a, a pale place right here. And that is where the soil was so poor that nothing would grow on it whatsoever. And so the wind was ca causing it to be a sand dune. We called it a sand blow. Every wind was continually blowing the sand into a, a sort of a moving uh, sector. So we say this was less than I had thought of when my father announced that we had bought some property on the Wisconsin River. <laughs> and, and so here's this, this, so we say, troublesome spot. Dad wanted it to be alone. He wanted it to be isolated and not where there's traffic, not where there's electricity and things like this. And here's Dad walking along the road to the shack. <laughs> and that was at high water, of course, and with the basket with goodies that we used to, to feed ourselves during the weekend and the dog. And the next slide, <clears throat> this little, should we say this little burgeoning structure. <laughs> this the beginning of the shack. And <clears throat> so the first thing that we had to do was to make a place where we could stay on weekends and vacations. We could be comfortable living there for these short periods. And, and so this is the way it started out. My brother is hammering something over the door. Uh, you can see there's a pipe for a fireplace stove. And the next slide will show you farther along. And now <clears throat> Here's dad with carrying a bucket. I think he's been out watering some trees somewhere that he had planted. I want you to notice, though, that the background behind my father's figure there, it gives you some idea of this, we say, the glamorous um, vegetation on this property. And the next slide will show you even more of that. <clears throat> and here dad and my sister Estella are planting a bird, bird house, of course. But take a look at the property. It's really. That's, should we say, surprisingly um, <laughs> bare. <laughs> and <clears throat> so again, uh, there we have a lot of work to be done. There was some marsh woods up, us joining the property, and that was the source of our heat for winter. And there's Dad um, tying the, a rope on a sled that he built, by the way. And we've cut, been cutting this with these, this wood with a two-man saw. The next slide will show you um, the family collected. Mother said, you know, I really don't like that picture. It makes us look like a family on relief. <laughs> <laughs> the dead, that's really true. So here's dad on the left, mother on the chair, on the step, my sister Estella and my brother Starker. That's the work crew. And all of us pitched in. I'm the photographer, of course, you don't see me. The whole objective of this good life, this stripped down reach for simplicity, the whole concept was quiet, privacy, time to think and to write. And I'm pleased to have this picture of dad sitting on the bench that we had built and <clears throat> writing in his journal. I don't think I need to explain to the group here that Aldo Leopold's excellent fame has been rested on his perfectly stunningly beautiful essays. So writing and thinking were crucial parts of this whole process. And the next slide will show you also the beginning of the next phase. After you've built the cabin, which will be a place where you can stay on weekends, the, is to start restoration. And it's really interesting looking back, all of the siblings we confront each other. Did you know what dad was planning when we bought this place? And I said, no, I, I just saw it starting to happen. And we all agreed. We just didn't know. He wasn't telling us, Carl, we're going to build, rebuild this, this vegetation. No. <laughs> it was all just a matter of, of we started and we, we wanted to make beautiful things where beauty was missing. Here's dad and mother. And very early on, that this is probably the first year of planting, and they're planting white pines on this rich plateau that you can see in the background. That's um, it's really less than 
best and wonderful. Now, in the next series, I'd like to show you some before and after shots. In each case, the, the, my photography back in the 1930s and 1940s gives you the image of what we started with. And then we have some shots taken in the year 2001, some 50, 65 years later, I guess. It would be about 60, 66. So here's the shack in all of its glory. And 1937, and then the next slide will show the shack today. And it's changed a little bit, I think you'll see. Um, the whole concept was to restore forests that be representative of the middle of Wisconsin. And there's a lot of white pine, some mixtures of red, some mixtures with jack, pine, oak, hickory, um, and, these, and, and shrubs around the edges, so that you got a lot of mix in, in, the, in the original, um, the original um, vegetative cover. I can remember very well Dad and I taking a bushel basket and walking down the streets in Madison with, <laughs> with a rake, gathering up acorns and, and seeds of the, tr the, the trees that were on the parkway, and bringing them out to plant them in the, at the shack. The next slide, another before and after shot. This is a picture of my, daughter, my sister Estella at the, at the gate to the shack property, 1937. And the, the next slide will show you the same price piece today. You can see the, the, on each side the, the posts that hold the gate. This, is the, this happens now to be a mix of mostly red pine and um, oak hardwoods. Here's a picture taken in 2001 of sunrise on a winter's day looking through Dad's restored forest. And this, I wish I could take a beautiful, as beautiful a picture as this, but this was done by um, a, a professional photographer, a very good one. When the forests were reestablished in the pattern that would represent um, it's the kind of mix that the middle, the sandy um, counties in the middle of Wisconsin would be, would be appropriate for them, <coughs> it was time then to start really um, putting in pa uh, prairies. Now prairies in Wisconsin are intermixed as, um, um, as so we say, openings in, amongst the forests. So the typical situation in this country would have been that you'd have pine hardwoods and then you'd have areas of prairie that were, were burned over at intervals because of the Indians and, the, um, and storms. Now the prairies, um, <coughs> when the, I think we, with a sense of gloom of the first attempts to establish prairie, and I remember going out and digging up native tree, native spe species of, of prairie grasses on, along railroad right away, and it was hard work picking them up. We'd put them in the car or in a wagon and, and haul them in to plant. That's not the way to restore prairie, I'll tell you. <laughs> <coughs> the way you do it is you get rid of your weeds by very, various tricks, and then <coughs> you seed in. Seeding is the crucial part not planting for prairie restoration. And the rewarding thing is that the, the prairie flowers are so beautiful. And so it's extremely, it's a happy event going out in the some spring or early summer and walking through these prairies. They're really stunning. The next slide will show you, in one of Dad's essays, he talks about <coughs> the buffaloes roaming through Wisconsin with their bellies tickled, tickled by the, the, the tall, beautiful, uh, flowers and the and native flowers in the prairie. So I think of often of, of the silphium, but you see the tall six foot flower stems there <coughs> that's related to compass plant. And <coughs> let me show you how a professional photographer, this is my, my picture, the professional photographer did, shows you the next slide. So um, the point I'm building, of course, is that it's an extraordinarily lovely kind of natural um, vegetation that belongs there in that part of Wisconsin. Here's another, this is, this is a, a, sec, a prairie section that my sister Nina had, had restored. <coughs> and you can see it goes off for a long ways and the, the mixture of flowers is really, again, spectacular. 
So here's Aldo Leopold about uh, 19, probably 47. He died three, three or four years later than that. But can, can I transmit to you the importance of this? There are several sectors of this import, being important. One, it was the, the wonderful challenge of getting away from trinkets. We did all of this with an ax and a two-man saw and a, <coughs> and a shovel. The second important point is that, <coughs> that the, the, the pleasure of restoring something beautiful does think something for your spirit, which is hard to describe. It's not just, that, isn't it nice? I'm with it, I'm in it, it's mine. Our, the five siblings in the family have shared this feeling about this being so much a part of us, we're there. And in fact, my house in Ithaca is now built from pines that we thinned from the planting. So in addition to by planting the trees that grew there, it's like Jack and the Beanstalk, or Jack, the house that Jack built. Jack, the, you planted the trees, you harvested them, you brought them to Ithaca, and you built a house. I, I meant to put in a slide of that. <clears throat> but Aldo, look at Leopold now looking very much like a comfortable, a, a comfortable landowner. How's that? I'd like to spend the rest of my time doing something like a commentary on Aldo Leopold's, um, what he left for us and our society. Of course, he's most noted for his land ethic, published in his book, A Sand County Almanac, 1949. Now, I'd like to go with you, take you through a series of, of uh, concepts of how the land ethic changed the over whole professional field of thinking of this type of ecology. The land ethic published in 1949 um, <coughs> was, as far as I can tell, the first suggestion that an ethical responsibility and ethical goals could really do something special and constructive for our society. If this was really a good idea, the chances, the chances that it could be judged then on the basis of how much effect did it have on other people's thinking? It wasn't just Aldo Leopold. Who else thought about this? Well, John Muir was a, a predecessor of Aldo Leopold. Uh, Francis uh, Marsh was one. Uh, Thoreau was one. They never used the word ethics. They talked a lot about the religious experience of seeing beautiful things. But it was Aldo Leopold who suggested that an ethical responsibility to your, to your world is really crucial. And I've represented this by a tree <clears throat> which grew from 1950 on the left to 2000 at the top. <clears throat> Aldo Leopold's land ethic being sort of the acorn at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and on, the, on your left side, I'm, I'm giving, stressing the, the concepts of, of a land ethic that are anthropocentric. You'll, you, I've taken you through that concept already. And on the other side, on your right, is the biocentric theories. And these are just a few of the ethical um, constructs that have been made by philosophers, biologists, um, careful thinkers in the subsequent 50 years. So let's start, let's go up the, on the anthrop anthropocentric side. The first one, after the 1949 start, was by Schweitzer and what he called was the life ethic. And you remember Schweitzer was famous for not wanting to kill anything. Every life form was precious. And, but that's because that's representing what I do to this part of the environment. And it's true also of Car Rachel Carson's Silent Spring where she really fiercely objected to what we were doing to our, and our a biological environment. Going on up to more recent times, Rozzi in, in Italy has suggested a, a type of ethics which he called ecological ethics. 
And E.O. Wilson, the famous um, Harvard entomologist, has um, described biophilia, which is man having, an, a, in a sense, a sort of a love relationship with the biological community. Notice where you start. And of course, uh, Weiss is patrimony of the people, and again, the, the people taking care of the, their patrimony. Can you see this again, the anthropocentric, uh, uh, that's a hard word, anthropocentricity. On the other hand, on the biocentric side, we have uh, the concept of deep ecology. In one of his essays in uh, San Connie Almanac, Aldo Leopold described the concept of taking the human part of the community away from the throne, the bon in charge, the patron, and putting him as a member of the community. And this is exactly what uh, has, has been the central of deep ecology. That is, they want to look at the biological world not as something that we own, that we do this and that to, but rather that it, we are a part of it. And we, can you see there's a distinction that we are, instead of being in charge of it, that we are, Dad said, the simple citizens of the community. And then another biocentric one would be Griffin's postmortem ethic, which is really postmodern ethic, pardon me. And then the, the most, for me, one of the most wonderful ones is Van Potter's suggestion in 1995 what he called global bioethics, global bioethics, the whole concept of it isn't just that you love Wisconsin, it isn't that you just love white pines, it's that the whole system, world-wise, planetary-wise, is, is a, is a, a biosystem bio of which we are a member. I'm illustrating the, that the concept of an ethical relationship to the biological world originated by my father has given rise to a whole family of ethical concepts. And, and then I'd like to diverge to another uh, part of a way to look at the, the, the what what we say, the, the jewels that my father left for, for us to, to enjoy. I'll come back here for just a minute. I've been, all my life, uh, I've been a, a biological scientist and I've lived by publishing papers and publishing books. And, and I know very well how this, the, the time course of what you have done, what I have done in, in my career, and it runs like this. Um, when you publish something and it's accepted in, the, in your community, you get a lot of attention for that. And then, th then there's a decline in interest as time goes on. And by and large, I'll speak of this as the half-life. That is, you lose half of the, the attention when you've dropped 50% of the rate at which you, were, you made a difference. And then the second, that happens in six years. This is true of not just engineering, not just biology, not the natural sciences, his, the, the humanisms humanistic societies also have the same thing, a half-life. You publish something and then it goes through this decay, all right? I want to show you what happened to San Colony Almanac in the next slide. Here's, um, in red, you'll see Carl Leopold's book. Um, <laughs> and it's classic. Uh, do you understand the, the word, the classic? This meaning that it did what it was supposed to do. It, it, um, it was published in 1964 and by 19... Um, 68, it was re reached its peak. It had to get a lot of attention. And its half-life was six years. So six years later, it lost to 50% of its attention. And then another six years, it was almost down to the, to the bare nub. Oh, I didn't explain to you the frequency of citations. Um, probably, probably most of you know about the, the publication of the international international science information organization in Philadelphia. They publish cur current contents and you've seen a lot of their publications. And they keep track of all the references. You publish a paper and it's cited in other people's papers. 
And these are citations, and they're all recorded by a computer in this ISI organization in Philly. Aldo Leopold's book now was published in 1950. It was first cited in any book, any paper, in 1962. And then, 50 years of increasing, increasing attention. I'm, I would like to say that, um, that th th uh, this is the second line of evidence that I propose that Aldo Leopold left not just an interesting co concept for us, but he, he provided a paradigm change. And those of you who know Tom Kuhn's concept of revolutionary changes in science, that a paradigm shift means that you've presented a completely new and extremely important concept that lives. It's accepted. It, think of Mendeleev's figure, uh, uh, leaving the concept of a, the, the table of uh, element of the, uh, phys the physical elements. This uh, has lasted for 100 years. And that's uh, the, the, almost the definition of what a paradigm shift offers in any, any intellectual activity. So a paradigm shift means that it really changes something central to our thinking. And then if it does that, then you've got a long persistence of its usefulness. It may ultimately be displaced. Nevertheless, it's long-term and its usefulness. <clears throat> and I'll give you a, a third thing that uh, gives you some indication of the impact of the ethical concept and the, rec the restoration concept have been. Um, <clears throat> my friend, a librarian at the institute where I work, has gone through um, the list of all the scientific journals, biological science, <clears throat> looking for, uh, excuse me, journals that would, that have carried on a, a concept uh, inclu including the land ethic. There's a, um, environment, a journal called Environmental Ethics, for instance. And this would be one example of, there probably is an ethical society that publishes this journal as part of its pr programs. Um, she was able to bring up um, seven um, such new journals since that, almost all of them from the 1990s. And these are all ones that have ethics as a part of their title. So the journal is really focused on ethics in biology. I asked her to do the same thing looking for restoration because we had been so involved in restoration that Aldo Leopold is so well, well known, of course, for his work in restoration ecology. There is a journal called Restoration Ecology. There is a Society of Restoration Ecology. So, and, and in addition to the seven journals that carry the concept of ethics along, there are five journals that carry the concept of restoration. The point of going through this is not braggadocio, but I want you to, to understand the, the, that there are people's legacies that impact some of the basic premises that we have we have lived by, or we have entertained in our, in our thinking of, of the world around us and our interactions with one another. These, these long-term effects of, your, of a new idea uh, constitute a paradigm. That is a new structure, a new image, which you then can apply to a lot of different uh, uh, questions in, in, your, in biological thinking. Let me turn then to um, some comments. I'd like to have a few comments about our, our education system. Um, I th I've <clears throat> there's an interesting book by Salman, S-U-L-L-M-A-N, who talked about the, the, the ability of people to th accept really new and innovative ideas. And uh, there's a lot of stories that are fun about Salman's book. I'm very struck by it. But one of the things that he held up as the most impressive innovator in the, in the sciences uh, <coughs> that, he, that he could point to, and it was Charles Darwin. Now let's see, why did he perceive this as being... <coughs> are we all right? Just turn the lights up again. Oh, fine. <coughs> 
The reason Charles Darwin passed with such flying colors in Solomon's est uh, estimate of what constitutes a really important source of ideas, the, the basic concept is that um, you have ability in more than a, a, a very limited specialty. And, and Charles Darwin had developed in his lifetime a high level of expertise in five science sectors. This included geology, it included limnology, it included uh, worms, what do I want to say, nematodes. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so he had five, and genetics, he had five areas of specialization. What do we see in, in my institute at, at Cornell now? We see that anybody who's interested in the environment is invited to leave because everybody, sorry, everybody is into genomics. I f see this with a sense of fear because I feel that we are becoming so specialized, so reductionist in, in our science, and this is reflected in our education system. This is, this is a, a, in my opinion, a really um, a scare sim signal that I feel very uncomfortable with. And I, I know that, I think that Cornell is, is worse about being compartmentalized into little narrow specialties, genomics, than most of the universities. But it's, but it's, it's a major university and it's uh, very widespread uh, in our nation. So the education system has the opportunity of living, giving people a chance to look at, at a wider scope of things than just your specialty. I also fear that by teaching reductionism so, with such, such tight focus that, <clears throat> that we, are, um, we are preparing our students for what we could have used when we came along and entered science and you know, I don't think that the technology that you use in our laboratories, in the Boy say in our Boyce Thompson Institute today, I don't think those techniques are going to be very helpful to people in the next generation. I think the education leaves, has the danger of training you for something that is, is not gonna be persistent. And the, the, the way to avoid that, it seems to me, is to expand the, new, the student's concepts and his thinking and his ability to comprehend over a wider range of, of science, science uh, concepts. I've given you a lot of stuff about Aldo Leopold's uh, heritage and how important I think it is. I think I've been able to pull out some evidence to show you that it is important and it is influencing thinking over a very wide sector of, of ecology and environmentalism and the basic sciences too. Um, I, <clears throat> I'd like to finish by talking about my, I, my concepts of why, what, what should we be alarmed about? What might counter the excitement and the, the constructive, constructive intellect of the ethical approach to our world and a, a, a ability to use restoration to better the quality of the world around us. I have three items to suggest as being very, very serious anti, should we say, anti-progress anti -prog factors. One of them is greed, one of them is poverty, and the third one is war. Now think, think of this with me. In the case of greed, some of the worst examples of greed are corporate greed, because you see there's no, there's no sense of responsibility. All you have to do is look at the, at the bottom line. If you're making money, by, then th that's fine. So a big problem with greed is not only does it wipe out a lot of the concepts of an intelligent management of your, your planet, but it is, and of course is terribly wasteful, but it trains people to think in the corporate image. 
it doesn't take any stretch of the imagination to realize that poverty erases the ability of a person to really think constructively about acting with restraint and uh, avoiding the destruction of quality th things that are in your environment that, that, that are in your way. So poverty is an automatic ticket to, to the exclusion of constructive thinking about your environment and uh, your resources. And the third one, war, I don't, I don't think I need to explain anything there. War, if I can just dismiss it and say, war is the discarding of all ethical concepts. It's the worst one, because the price in terms of human suffering, in terms of the, not only the environment, but all, of, all the resources, all of our civilization structure, pays an enormous price for war. Um, so I think I've just about used my time. I want to say a few things about the, the Binghamton um, pres preserve that Dick Andrus has been doing. I think it's simply a marvelous thing. And I want to tell you how wonderful I think it is. I think that um, in, uh, the Cornell campus has been dominated by big corporate uh, ideas about how to build huge buildings and get lots of money in from. Um, and <clears throat> I think that it takes someone with a lot of nerve to, to control that and say, no, look, we have a perfectly beautiful piece of forest. It has wonderful educational opportunities for our students. It's wonderful for us, the faculty, to go out and use it. So it's a perfectly delightful outcome and a, a very essence of an ethical relationship with the community here in Binghamton. Aldo Leopold, one of his famous um, definitions of the land ethic, as he says, a thing, is, a thing is good if it preserves the integrity, the stability, and the beauty of the biota, he said the biota is sort of the biological world. And let me say, I, I, the, the acid test of the Binghamton University's new beautiful preserve is it certainly does stabilize the integrity, the stability, and God knows the beauty. If you feel that there is a rift between science, uh, between the hard sciences and, as you said, reductionist science yes. and social sciences, um, how do you feel about it? I meant to infer that I, I'm very unhappy. I feel... Or could you elaborate a little? Yeah. Central, the central part of this reduction system, reductionist system is that... Um, our teachers are sucked into the concept that we have to train students to do what we wish we had learned early on. And so, in the year 2004, we're training people in a, in a real way, I think, that's influenced, that our way of training them is influenced by the concept of what I would have liked to have learned when I was mid-career or a student. And this has, this has a basic fallacy, in my opinion, because things are changing very fast. Think of how much technology has changed. Think of, we were talking as we came over to the building about the changes in cameras over the past 10 years. And it's what you knew, what, when I was a 15-year-old taking some of these photographs, I thought I knew a lot. But look, that's all out of it. It's not, not there anymore. It's so changed. And so the danger is we, we train people too much to do something that, that, that was prepare them for the past. Yes, uh, I just returned from Costa Rica uh, with Dick Andrus and uh, had an opportunity, Good. once again, I've been there three times now, to, to go to TFI and see the project that you've been working on. And I was wondering, um, uh, now that you've, you've done this for 12 years or so, um, what, 
what do you think you've learned from the experience of restoring a forest down there, and what might have surprised you about the oh, whole uh, thing? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful surprises. The, the biggest surprise to me has been that our fastest growing species that we're using in this restoration work, I've carefully used that word, restoration work with fast growing species gives an incredible rate of growth. Andy, we're getting three meters per year in height of some of our hardwoods. <laughs> and that means that in, in 10 years, we've gone 30 meters high, which is the height of, I don't know, in Binghamton of an 11-story building, but that's pretty high. Um, the next thing I've learned that, that isn't, isn't nearly so jolly is that you can go out and show that restoration is possible. You can plant the trees, you can pick out the, the types of, of um, natural system that you want to re restore, and you can hope that maybe the neighbors will notice this, and they might even try it. No. <laughs> it's just incredible that here we are, we're working away, and we just throw our hearts into it, and you know, we really are busting to, to get this, this restoration done. And as far as I can tell, the neighbors think we're sort of crazy. Maybe we have too much money and don't know what to do with it. I don't know, I'm guessing that. But that's an example of a real plus and a real minus. But on this subject, if I can wax a little longer on it, because it's such a nice one, the subject is, how do you get the complexity of a, of a really a native um, rainforest? The, the numbers of species in, a, in, a, per, in an acre of a, of a tropical rainforest range in the level of 10,000 species. Look, we have, in Costa Rica, we have 2,400 species of hardwood trees. It's amazing. So, um, complexity, how does that come along? And we really hadn't, we had sort of spun sort of fairy tales about how we were gonna get complexity in. But then, as the trees grow tall, and crown closes in, then we get monkeys, and we get toucans, then we get guans, they're great big turkey, like chachalacas, great big birds, bats, and these are coming in and bringing seeds in as they defecate in our woods, and the seeds, I have some really fun pictures of the, the incre increased complexity that's coming along spontaneously. We didn't do anything but get the tree cover. All right, back to the politics. Um, <laughs> I think um, that the Gandhi type of objection, just res passive resistance, is, is probably the best thing that we can do. And I think that any type of violent uh, res response is, is not making headway. Um, we've seen it over and over again in the world that people have rebelled against one, one group or another. The, and and the, the, the more fiercely they act against it, the more troublesome it became. And I think that's exactly where our nation is today. Outside of the hard sciences, what kind of uh, specific cultural or religious factors do you find necessary to extend the the land or the an ethic to um, other realms like land or other components of land, like other parts of God. I think that in, in this particular community, the person sitting in the front row over here is a beautiful example of just exactly what's needed to arouse that kind of interest in the, an ethical relationship to the, to the natural world. And it's very crucial that young people get in contact with the soil, with the plants that are there. Surely that is the, about the best teacher of, uh, of how to love, I use the word carefully, how to love the environment that we're in, is to be in it and to know about it and to work with it. Ah, the question is public versus private ownership of the land. And I'm not prepared to make any kind of a assertion here. I think that um, um, it becomes very complicated. 
a friend of mine in Iowa, Paul Johnson, who has been uh, very much concerned with, with sensible use of private land, has been, um, he has wonderful ideas about how to, how to get there. And you know, years go by and it's a little difficult to see how that's getting along. Then, of course, you can say, well, how about government owning the land and taking very good care of it? Let me tell you that Aldo Leopold's wilderness area in the Gila uh, forest in, in southern Arizona has, has been overgrazed by cattle for the last 25 years. It's a mess. I know, I was there. And I think the government over ownership is entangled with some of the worst problems and, and it, it, it's, it's not a good solution. Am I making any constructive <laughs> comments? I don't know. I yes. really don't. But not that's, an it's not an easy one. And you know that's sort of the cent center part of, the, of what we're talking about. That is learning to be sensible in the management of property, public or private. One of the things that I still struggle with a lot is people that are knowledgeable about issues and still propagate what I see as environmental destruction. And it's one thing that I find really difficult to address. So there's a, a, cross, a, a, a conflict between they're saying that they love the, love the land and then they do dumb things. Right. <laughs> yeah. and, it, and, and most of the time what I'm talking about is not like people going out and cutting down trees, but their actions might be somewhat indirect, whether it be like yes. supporting... Well, that's almost the worst one. Yeah. That's something that I've found to be difficult to address and I just want to get any suggestions. My next door, uh, let me illustrate with a little side remark. My next door neighbor in Ithaca is a professor of land planning at Cordell University, he's a full professor. He built a house that's 7,000 square feet and he lives there alone. <laughs> and, and he lives in the little room in the basement that was intended for the servant. I know, because I walked through the house and that was added on as a place where the, the, the live-in servant would live. Oh, but I think that, I can't remember how many bathrooms he's got, but I'd say something like four or five. The, the next door neighbor over there is the 9,000 square feet, and he has five bathrooms and seven toilets. There's a his and a hers in several of the bathrooms. Now, if you just think of the, think of the energy, I mean, you talk about the energy of cars, if you look around just in this community, I suppose it's as it is in Ithaca, we're just smothered now with, with beginning castles. And, and the, the cost, not just of the building of them, but the upkeep, think of the air conditioning, think of the heating. And, and so doing, saying, even if you're an intelligent, well-educated person, a full professor at a very important university in the United States, and you do something stupid, in my opinion, then I find that very difficult to deal with. <laughs> You, I feel like I'm one person. How can I change the government? These corporate things. Like, yeah. how do you get? Like, I mean, this is an, an inspiring story, but how do you get that? You know, where? How do you so just you, do dumb? This is my little this stuff. How's that? that you open the student's mind to a wider vista. And I think, yes, yeah, the center of your question. And I, it's, we, in the university, we do, we, and it, we do encourage people to get into this, this channel, this reductionist channel, and to minimize your, your contact. A, a, a good way to avoid that is by having lots of, of seminar, seminars where people will, that's not just a talk, but people will really get together and discuss things together over a wider range of, of professional interest. So um, I think it really is, depends, depends now on the student being willing to say, look, I, I want to study theater. I'm a, GL, I'm a major in plant genetics, but I want to get smart in, in theater too. So it takes a lot of gumption to really insist that I want a broader education. I want to study poetry. Wow. I had a professor as an undergrad tell me that 
tell me that in, in biology we're learning more and more about less and less and I would <laughs> agree with that. And I was just curious if you have uh, any recommendations as to how to change the university setting and education process, specifically in biology, as to how to change that sort of um, implication that we're driving to our undergrads. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> um, I guess one of the things that would certainly be an important part of an answer to this question of how do you get your undergrad student to having a capability in more than one specialty, a wider view vista again. Um, one is if you have a student that really wants to do something that's outside of your, your expertise, for heaven's sakes, encourage them. Say, yes, do it. Um, I think that encouraging, um, you know, at Cornell we have a couple of people in the biological sciences who, whose minds run to a, a wide range of kinds of biological issues. And I just think grabbing a guy like that and putting him in charge of a seminar system, letting everybody talk, talk it all out, is about as good as uh, an influence as you can have. But you know, we, our seminar system at the Boyce Thompson Institute is one genetic seminar after another genetic seminar after another genetic seminar. And you know, I stopped going. I just, first of all, I can't understand them. <laughs> so, but this is a really tough order. And so our science, our education system is moving increasingly into this this uh, trenching system, and um, I think we share a sense of concern.